Hello, my friends, and welcome to the 89th episode of Patterson in Pursuit. Got another fun conversation for you this week talking about metaphysics. We're talking about one area of metaphysics in particular called Mariology. Mariology is just the study of parts and wholes. So the question is, what is the relationship between a whole object and the parts which compose a whole object? Are there such things as whole objects in the first place? Or really, are there only simple substances that don't really have any parts to them? This is another one of those areas that sounds really esoteric and useless, but actually it gets to the heart of a bunch of different issues in metaphysics. It even gets into philosophy of mind. Right off the get-go in this conversation, we talk a bit about the philosophy of mathematics and geometry because some of the concepts are related. So it's a really fun conversation and one that I wish more people would have. My guest this week is Dr. Andrew Brenner, who's a postdoc researcher doing work in metaphysics at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Before we dive into it, if you guys are interested in economics and the methodology of economics, I've got an article coming out next week called The Abuse of A Priorism in Economics that you guys might enjoy. I'm actually an A Priorist myself. I think A Priorism has an appropriate place in economics. But I also think there are some schools of extreme a priorism which actually kind of abuse the methodology. It's something I've been wanting to write for years. This is actually the topic that got me interested in philosophy, was exploring the fundamentals of economics. And so if that's something that you're also interested in, I think you'll enjoy that piece. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Andrew Brenner. All right, Dr. Andrew Brenner, thanks very much for coming on Patterson in Pursuit. I appreciate you taking the time to be with me today. Thanks. I got some abstract questions for you today that too few people talk about. I want to talk to you about composition and basic objects, and what's sometimes called muriology. And in thinking about some of these topics, I think they're fundamental. They're, they really get at the heart of what types of things exist in the world. Our common sense ideas about how about how we think the what the world is composed of immediately get challenged by basic questions in muriology. I'll give you one example. So I have in front of me a humble red pin, and everybody is going to say, okay, yes, there's definitely a pin here in front of me. Everybody knows you can see it here as an object. And it seems also true to say, well, this object has parts. It's got kind of the, the metal part in the middle. It's got the ink part also. It's got this little plastic cap. Okay, so we've got parts of the pin, and we've got the pin. But the question is, do the parts of the pin exist in addition to the whole pin? Are we talking about multiple things? Is there something over and above the composite parts, the little, the little units of matter and little uh, smaller features? Is that something that is out there and then there's something on top of it, which is the pin all together as one thing? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, one way of characterizing this question is, are there any composite objects, objects with parts, or are there just little partless things? So uh, for example, if you have N, uh, call a partless thing a simple, this is just something without parts. Mm -hmm. um, it's like the basic building blocks of matter, for example, if there are any, right? Um, uh, so if you have N simples allegedly composing the pen, then you have at least N plus one objects if they compose a pen, right? You have yeah. the, the N simples and then the pen, right? Uh, so the question you're asking is, maybe how many objects do you have right there? Do you have n objects, just the simples? Or do you have n plus one, or n plus more than that objects, the simples plus the pen? Right. Um, right. So, so yeah. what? So a, an immediate uh, uh, other question that comes up is, if we say that there's n plus one, if we say that there's parts, and there is also the pen. The question is, okay, well, where is the pen? Like the, the parts take up space, the, the units of matter take up space. Does the pen take up additional space? Does it take up no space? Where does it fit? Where could it fit? I mean, I guess it's just located where its parts are located, right? So it's, it doesn't have a point size location. It has an extended location. That's not that bad, right? That's not a... Well, so each individual part takes would take up space. But the... Um, maybe, maybe not. But okay. <laughs> Could there be a part of a pin that doesn't take up space? Uh, yeah, if it, if it's point sized, so then it, then it has a location, but it's not extended. What does that um, mean to say something that ha something would have location without extension? Uh, it doesn't have a length, 
So maybe it has zero length, you could say. So uh, the, how could there be a zero length thing within a thing that has length? Oh yeah, so that is that that is a good question. Now, so um, so a lot of these questions were first, as far as I know, addressed by Indian philosophers like a million years ago, like like seventeen hundred years ago, something like that. <laughs> uh, and Buddhist philosophers tended to defend the view that there weren't any composite objects; mm. they're just little parts, which they called um, sometimes they called dharmas. Uh, these little basic building blocks of reality. There weren't composite objects in addition to the basic building blocks of reality. Mm. Um, and this is one of the questions, this is one of the, the arguments uh, at least some Buddhist philosophers would give. Um, if you had extended composite objects like pens, um, well, the, the, the dharmas, the basic building blocks of reality, they're not extended in space. So they, they, they don't take up, they have location, but they don't have extension. So they're point sized. Um, that's an assumption they make. We can question that assumption. Right. But if it's true, then how could these point size objects that don't have any length, or uh, uh, they don't have any length or height or depth or anything like that. Um, how could they make up an object or how could they compose an object like a pen, which does have length and height right. and depth? Um, uh, yeah, I I don't know much about that argument. <laughs> um, it, I mean, it, if you have enough of them, why not, right? If you have an infinite number of them. It sounds like it, if you're saying, if you have an infinite number of zeros, eventually you get a one. If you have an infinite number of things that take up exactly zero space, you can't. It seems like you couldn't get an object that takes up any space. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, like if you have a line, the line seems to have length. And uh, I mean, that's, maybe that's exactly. Maybe I'm just saying what I'm saying here is question begging, right? Now, you couldn't have a line in addition to the points. That you right. Have right. Line. Yeah, I think but, that uh, lines are made up of parts that have space that, that take up space. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, you could also say that. Maybe you, you would reject this assumption we're starting with, that mm. there are these basic building blocks of reality that don't have any extension, even if they have location. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what to say about all this. I mean, this is like, seems like um, more of a question for geometry or mathematics. Or something. Right. It was certainly. Uh, it definitely but, gets right to the heart of the philosophy of mathematics in general. It's one of those, it's one of those questions that both, it kind of crosses over. Right, because it's something that's about pure geometry. It's about mathematics. It's also about reality in the world. You know. Yeah. Well, but it's also one of these questions in the uh, seemingly paradoxical questions about the nature of space, hmm. like the sort of questions Zeno came up with in ancient Greece. Right. These paradoxes. How can Achilles cross the stadium? First, he has to cross the first half. First, he has to cross mm -hmm. first half of that, and the first half of that before that. Right. Um, you can never get started. So the, these questions like that are connected to the sort of question we're talking about right now. How right. can a pen have extension if it's made up of parts which aren't extended? Right. Um, and I'm, I'm not very confident saying anything about any of that stuff. <laughs> but we're totally right that this is one of the, 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 the sort of challenge you just mentioned. Assuming if pens exist and they're made up of these mm. point size, extensionless, basic constituents of reality, matter, right? Mm. Um, how could they make up a pen which has extension? That, that's exactly the sort of challenge Buddhist philosophers, at least some some gave. And I, I don't know any names off the top of my head because it's hard <laughs> to find sources. And I, I don't know enough about this subject. Um, but I, I feel like um, the only reason we brought that up is because you were saying something about the pen and then I got a sidetrack. Yes. So one question was that if you have the, the zero dimensional point, could it compose um, objects to take up space? But that was, yeah, that was kind of an aside that was about the more general question, where it, which is, is the object something in existence in addition to the parts? So there, as far as I can tell, there's only two answers, yes or no. So why don't we kind of talk about both possibilities? So, so what does it mean to say the object is something that exists in addition to all of the parts which compose it? Yeah. So uh, the way I characterized this question earlier is in terms of the number of objects we have. Hmm. If you have any simple objects, objects without parts, uh, and you're asking, do they compose a further object? You're asking, are there n objects, or are there at least n plus one objects in this particular region where you hold the pen? Um, uh, one little complication here is some people think there are composite objects like pens, but they're just identical with their parts. So if you have um, a composite object like a pen, you can still say there's only n objects there, if, even if it's composed of n parts, 
right? Because the pen is just identical with all of the parts. Um, so this view is called composition as identity hmm. for obvious reasons. Um, and I, I think a lot of people when they first hear it might think that sounds intuitive. I'm not sure. It's actually radically counterintuitive because then you're saying one thing is identical with a bunch of things. Yeah. How could it be the case? In fact, uh, it seems like that's definitely not the case because th this is one thing. This is a bunch of things. Like it seems like they're they're different, right? Mm -hmm. If A is identical with B, all of A's properties, B is going to have all those properties too, right? You, if if Andrew, my name is Andrew Brenner. If Andrew is is identical with Brenner, then if Andrew is five foot eight, Brenner is five foot eight. If Andrew is hungry, Brenner's hungry. Mm -hmm. um, any properties Andrew has, Brenner has. So if the whole is or the, the composite is identical with the parts. Um, any properties the composite has is going to be identical. Is going to be properties that the parts have. But it seems like the composite has properties that the whole. Sorry, the composite has properties that the parts don't have. Mm -hmm. The composite is a thing. The parts are many things. Um, so leaving that complication aside for a second, <laughs> let's assume that if there are composite objects, if there's a pen, then uh, there's at least n plus one objects there. The n parts of the pen plus the pen. Um, uh, so I don't think there are any composite objects. If you have n simple objects, n partless objects, then there's just n objects there. They never compose anything else. They never make up a, a bigger thing. Mm. Uh, uh, and this has some counterintuitive consequences mm -hmm. too. It, it seems like all the big objects we interact with all the time are just not actually there. Right? There aren't any tables. My, my laptop's on a table right now. There aren't any tables. There are just like little part, partless objects, little symbols, maybe. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say what there is. Right? Mm. That's a complicated question. Maybe there's just, maybe it's particles, maybe it's fields, maybe it's strings, maybe it's something else, whatever. I just don't think we have very good reason to think there are composite objects. Okay. Right? Because, yeah, because that, that takes us from parts to this further object, a composite object composed of those parts. And that just seems gratuitous. So um, let me ask you a uh, or a couple of things. So uh, for the first point you made, or the first example that you gave about the whole being identical to the parts, I'm not even I'm really not sure that is a coherent concept for another reason. Uh, it, I, I don't know, it begs the question, it's saying that there is such a thing as an object here. And there is such a thing as the parts here, and they're actually the same thing. It seems like it's making a distinction, and then it's saying there's no distinction. It seems kind of logically contradictory. Am I missing something there? Um, well, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be contradictory in that way. So if I say Superman's here, Clark Kent is here, <laughs> oh, and Superman is Clark Kent. There's nothing oh, contradictory. There, oh, right? oh so, so is the claim then it's, it's that... A, a composite object is another way of referencing individual yeah. units. It's just another yeah, it's a name for individual units. Or not maybe not the individual units, but all of those parts taken together. Well, that's the part that seems contradictory. Uh, so yeah. to say yeah. all of them taken together would be all of them it would be something definitely different than all of them individually or referencing them individually, right? Yeah. So is it, if you have um, part one, part two, part three, and then you have the pen composed of all those parts, the pen isn't identical with part one, and it's not identical with part two, and it's not identical with part three. It's identical with part one and two and three taken together. So if you have a, if you have a identity statement, A equals B, A is identical with B. Hmm. In this case, you would say um, Y is identical with the X's. So you'd have an equal sign with a singular term on one side and a plural term on the other. One thing on one side, multiple things on the other. And, you know, that that sounds weird, right? Well, but if, uh, you, if you do that, I think, isn't that necessarily saying that there's an additional object here? Uh, if you can I, reference something that is in per, that, that particular arrangement of, or that particular number of bits, and at some point you get to that threshold and now you have an object that you're talking about, it seems like that's you're saying this is not identical to just to the individual units. I mean, people who endorse this sort of view would just deny that. They'd say it's like okay. Superman and Clark Kent. If okay. you got Superman, you got you also got Clark Kent, but it's not an additional thing, right? It's okay. Just two names, of the same thing. Okay. So uh, that's what they'd say in this case. You got pen, and you got parts, and pen refers to the same thing that parts do. 
Okay. Well, so so let's go back to the the uh, the other question here. And I agree with you that I don't think composite object. I don't think composite physical objects exist. Maybe there are other types of composite objects. I'm not sure. But it does have a bunch of really counterintuitive conclusions. Like like you said, there there are no pins. I mean, you could. You, there's one sense in which you can reference a pin if you're just talking about individual units in a particular location in space that aren't unified together. Like, okay, maybe we can talk about pins that way. But when we really analyze, oh man, there's no, you know, I've got a water bottle here. There's no water bottle. There's no pin. There's no microphone. There's no laptop. That seems very unpalatable. Um, but if you get over maybe some of the intuitive. Um, distaste for that. There's other deeper questions that I find really hard to explain, which is something like, if this isn't an object, this pin here is not an object, and I'm, there's just units of whatever make it up, let's say units of space, then why is it the case that it all seems to be kind of unified together? It behaves af as if it's one thing. It doesn't just kind of fall apart. It's like there's relations, particular relations between the individual units which compose this object. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, so, so, um, so yeah. So just to be clear, when we say, you know, there's no pen, we don't mean they're hallucinating when you look right. down at your hand, what you're holding in your hand, like there's nothing there. Um, <laughs> there's stuff there. There are things there. It's just not a pen. It's a bunch of little things. They just don't compose a bigger thing. Right. That's not, that's not a crazy thing to say. Right. Um, it's not like composite objects are, it's, it's not like there's a conspiracy theory. <laughs> Right? It's just kind of a, our brains work a certain way. They see a bunch of little things. They don't realize our brain, we, we can't visually distinguish all of the little parts of the pen, right? Like subatomic particles or whatever. Um, so our brain, you know, it, in order to help us get by, in order to help us interact with the world, our brain's like, well, that's one object, a pen. Um, and here's another object, a table, right? So this is just a quirk in the way our brains work, mm -hmm. right? And maybe of language, too. Maybe of language, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, now, now, why do the little parts hang together? Yeah. Right? Uh, I, I mean, I don't know. Ask a physicist, right? Why do little parts hang together, right? <laughs> maybe they're like attractive forces. They're repulsive forces. Sometimes, uh, you know, maybe you can say, why do the parts hang together? Because you glued them together. Because you put glue there, right? <laughs> uh, so you can give a simple an explanation as that. It's not like they need to make up this weird occult further object in order to... Well, so move. maybe, maybe, maybe not, though. So let's let's take the glue example. Mm -hmm. What is the uh, why would it be that glue, which is just other parts, uh, it's it's other individual units, it's not an object itself. Why would that result in uh, a unity of of physical space time units? So so a, a yeah. more more fundamental is if you're appealing to forces and maybe laws. Where are the laws? Are the laws something in the system? Are the laws additional objects outside the system? Uh, well, I mean, I mean, you, you, we get to questions about what are what are laws of nature, and then, then we're like off the deep end, right? We're getting into like difficult territory. But I mean, the, the simple answer here is just maybe there are little bits of matter, subatomic particles, maybe something smaller, or whatever. That's not my job. That's the physicists will tell us what's there, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they behave a certain way. Uh, sometimes they attract each other. Sometimes they repel each other, or whatever. Right? And sometimes the behavior of these little objects, turns out they move together, right? Like a school of fish, right? You don't need to posit this school of fish. There's just a bunch of fish mm. when they swim together, right? Or you don't need a flock of birds. It's just the birds. They just happen to be moving together right now. So you could say the same thing about your pen. There's no pen. It's just a bunch of little things, and they move together, right? Ask a physicist why they behave that way. Um, there's no deep metaphysical puzzle here. There's okay. just a question about fundamental physics. Why do little bits of matter behave as they do? Okay. I think yeah. it does get into some bigger metaphysical questions when you're talking about like patterns in nature, because what does the pattern something that exists in addition to the whatever the the phenomena is that's moving in the world. But but it's a good segue to another question that's related to this is are we talking only about physical things? Is this, a, is this a universal claim that all there exist are symbols? Is that in every possible metaphysical realm? So, for example, if I'm talking about uh, consciousness, is consciousness 
itself is simple. When I observe my visual field, I got all these little bits. They seem to kind of be unified together into one experience. So what do you think about that? Um, I mean, yeah, for me, it's a, it's a universal claim. I, I don't think there, that composition ever happens. I don't think little things ever compose bigger things. Um, as to the question, are there just symbols? I'm a little more hesitant to say what there is, right? Um, so, so uh, I, uh, I don't think we have any reason to think they're composite objects. And I think like Occam's razor, simplicity considerations make us think there probably aren't any composite objects, just gratuitous hypothesis. Um, but there, it doesn't follow that there have to be simples, actually, even though I've been talking that way for convenience hmm. sake. So um, maybe there's stuff, for example. So we have the English language has singular terms like the dogs, or, yeah, sorry, not singular terms, we have count nouns, right? Like I have four dogs, you can count dogs. Um, and we have mass terms like water or stuff, right? You can't say I have four stuffs. You say like <laughs> four pounds of stuff or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so for all I know, maybe reality isn't made up of little things, simples. Maybe it's made up of stuff, like undifferentiated stuff. <laughs> Right. In that case, you couldn't, you wouldn't say there are symbols, right? Because there aren't things. There's stuff. Right, so I'm, I'm sorry if this is a little abstract. Right? No, so that's I, fine. My basic point is just, I'm not gonna make these bold claims about ultimately what does exist. Right. Okay. Uh, I, I just want to focus on what I'm pretty sure it doesn't exist. Right. And 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 maybe there are further options besides things and stuff. So some people think there's structure, where structure isn't a thing and it's not stuff. I don't really understand what that view, I don't really know what that, that's all about. But some people claim this is a coherent third option, right? Uh, people called ontic structural realists, for example. Um, I've never been able to make sense of that. But anyway, that's like a potential third option for what does exist. So, uh, so yeah, I'd, yeah. I want I'd rather to focus on what probably doesn't exist. I want to pursue that line of inquiry. Um, if there's just stuff, what stuff? What that means to say there's undifferentiated stuff. And let me let me give you um, something I'm consciously experiencing, and then I'd like to hear your analysis of it. So, if it were the case that all that existed were undifferentiated stuff, I have a hard time explaining the phenomenon in my visual field because if I just think about Let's say that the, that these are objects or these are some things. That green, I've kind of, I've got a window over there, some trees out there. There are green parts of my visual field and brown parts of my visual field and red parts of my visual field. Surely that is real differentiation in the world, right? Yeah. Sorry. When I said undifferentiated, mm -hmm. I just meant the stuff isn't broken into different things. The stuff may be green over here and red over there. So it's differentiated in that respect. But if you have the properties of over here and over there, isn't that some kind of real differentiation between them? Yeah, but it, not differentiation in the, the sense I was trying trying to, I was getting after, right? Differentiation in terms of there are individual things, and one of them is red and one of them is green. Maybe there's green stuff and there's blue stuff. Ah. There aren't green things and blue things and red things. I, oh, okay. And, and you know, this, this distinction comes up in our language, right? Mm. So we have count nouns like dog and glass, sorry, glass is ambiguous, dogs and phones, right? And then we have mass terms like water and stuff and air. Um, so like we're, we're, we're familiar with, to some extent with this distinction in everyday life, um, which is normally not brought to our attention. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, let's say there may be, for all I know, there's undifferentiated stuff. I just mean that there aren't individual things. There's mm -hmm. still stuff. And different stuff has different properties. Like some stuff is red and some stuff is blue. Um, so or would it be some parts of the stuff is red and some are like some... I'm having a hard time with the with this. Um, so, so let's just focus just on visual field. Could it yeah. be possible to say that there's only one thing there? It's just stuff. It's un well, and that case wouldn't be one thing. It's just stuff, right? I'm, I'm sorry. I, okay. I, I feel like you might be getting off topic from composition, to be honest. I, I was just trying to explain earlier why I'm not confident. Oh, yeah. I want to see what does exist, mm. right? Because there's actually like options we normally don't even think about. Like maybe there aren't things, there's just stuff. Um, but you're right. This is like 
uh, a confusing subject because we're normally not used to thinking of the world that way, mm. right? There are things, there's not stuff. Um, yeah, so, but, but, but just to clarify, to say there's just stuff, that doesn't mean there's one thing. There mm. aren't any things, right? There's just stuff. <laughs> right? In other words, if we were going to give an entirely perspicuous or accurate description of the world, we would just use mass terms like, like water and air, right? These are just examples of mass terms, right? Um, where you can't count them. You can't say there's three airs, right? He says there's like five pounds of air, something like that, or five meters, five square meters, whatever. Um, uh, so when I say that the world might be made of stuff, I'm just saying maybe that's that's the way the world is. And, and again, I, I, yeah, maybe we're getting a little off topic. I think it's still about composition, though, because the, you know, when you say is there stuff, is there things in the stuff? I mean, is there parts of the stuff? Can I carve up yeah. the stuff? It's still about like, and if you can carve it up, are the parts existing in addition to the stuff, or is there one, you know, one? blob of cookie dough and then you carve them off into individual cookies or did they exist in addition yeah yeah so they, they, there could be both things and stuff i guess right and there could <laughs> be thing which compose sorry stuff which composes things right maybe there's like a glob of stuff but they compose a pen i love right? it I guess that's possible sure I, i'm just saying it's not, how am i supposed to know right uh okay. again that kind of seems like the sort of thing maybe physics will like figure that out one day um, I, I yeah. hope other people appreciate that there, this is an excellent sentence you just said, and it, a lot of people might kind of roll their eyes at philosophy, but actually there's so much packed into this. The claim is maybe there are things and stuff. <laughs> like if you just step back and think yeah. about that, maybe there are <laughs> things and stuff. I love it, but it's true that that is a lot of meat packed into those words that seem ambiguous and seem like, well, what are you talking about? Well, that is a really big deal. But we can go back a little bit more to um, composition in particular. So, so let's say it's the case that in addition to parts, you have uh, holes. You have these are these are the holes. There's a separate type of thing. Mm -hmm. There's another issue that I struggle with this, which is. Um, illustrated by the Sorites paradox. So you, you might ask the question, when is there an object in addition to the parts? So let's say that there's such a thing as an object like a heap of sand, and there are such things as objects like grains of sand. Okay, so let's say there's a, these are two separate objects. So if I were to try to create a heap of sand by moving one grain of sand over here, one grain of sand over here. Now we just have, you know, three grains of sand, but it's not a heap yet. You keep going and you keep going. Is, isn't, mustn't it be the case that at some point the addition of one grain of sand brings a heap into existence? Isn't that, isn't that kind of an inescapable thing you must accept if you think that there are such things as composite objects? Um... Maybe, maybe not. I mean, I think most people who believe in composite objects are going to have to deal with this. Um, some people just might bite the bullet and say, yeah, once you add that one more grain of sand, this whole new object comes into existence, a heap. Before you just had a bunch of grains of sand, now you got a big heap, right? Uh, other people might say um, the composite object already existed. Just it wasn't a heap until you arranged its parts and pushed them together, right? Uh, that's Whoa. kind of weird. Into that okay. view. I haven't thought of that one. Um, but that's another option. So uh, and that, that's one way of avoiding vagueness. I, so in fact, so that, that's the view I had in mind there is called universalism, compositional universalism, muriological universalism. Just means like any objects compose another object. So my shoes and the Eiffel Tower, they compose an object. Like you and your microphone compose an object. Um, whatever, my shirt and Barack Obama compose an object. So uh, in this game, what the universalists would say about that heap example is just that composite object already existed. Um, it's just, it's sand parts were scattered across the beach and you brought them together. You turn that composite object into a heap, but it already existed. Just like you existed well before you were conceived, right? It's just your parts are scattered all over the place. Um, 
And now they're now they're like put together so you can be a functioning human being. And one day you'll die and you'll decompose and your parts will be scattered across the globe and you'll still exist, right? You'll just be this weird scattered object. So th this is a view you might have, right? Um, I just don't think that's the really, that's the normal everyday common sense view. The normal everyday common sense view is going to have to deal with these sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. What what happens, like, if you believe in, like, sandcastles, when, when did that sandcastle come into existence? Like, because you can add each grain of sand really slowly. It sounds really counterintuitive to think there's some grain of sand that made this object come into existence. Mm -hmm. And when, you the, could run it. when the wind blows, it pops out of existence. Yeah, right? So that's weird. Um, on the other hand, it sounds weird to say it's vague that it exists. How could it be vague whether something exists, right? And right. It, it's either there or it isn't. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, these sorts of puzzles crop up all over the place. You can run it in reverse, right? You can start with the sandcastle and remove... The grains of sand one by one at some point whatever composite object was there you might think it doesn't exist anymore uh when did it go out of existence you remove the grains of sand one by one or do it with a human body and then and then you get really confused right so um, a, a dip so i like this i like this line of reasoning um as a criticism of the idea of the existence of composite objects i think that's correct i think it's much more sensible to say well a sand castle is a word that we use to reference some particular area of space with bits, with units of matter that are arranged in a particular way. That's about a concept. Yeah. And that way, if the wind blows and some sand particles move, well, it's still the same sandcastle in the sense that it's still a concept in my head. It's it's not something that's necessarily tied. There's not one one to one correspondence with the state of objects in the world in all circumstances. But then I put on my devil's advocate hat and I say, okay, what about living things? This is another famous example. If there are no composite objects, are there any living creatures? So it seems like if we were to, to apply the Sorites paradox to say a lizard, and he, yeah. the lizard has parts, he's got like organs and whatever, and he's moving around. It seems like when you take an organ out, you, you remove one particular part, you're actually taking a lizard out of existence. It seems like there's this other, it seems like lizards are unified things that operate somehow as a coherent whole versus just the operation of the liver or the scales on the lizard. So what's going on there? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I think the exact same puzzles come up when you talk about living things. I mean, the, the, the difference between a living thing and most of the other things we interact with is just the living thing, the parts in question interact with each other in a very special way, mm. right? Um, kind of this big homeostatic chemical reaction. What that means is a big chemical reaction shaped like a lizard. Uh, it's gaining and losing parts all the time and it's self-maintaining, right? So uh, so the, the big chemical reaction takes in food. It like incorporates that material to help the chemical reaction keep going. Uh, it excretes material, it doesn't need anymore, right? Um, so I don't think there's anything meta metaphysically special about that sort of chemical reaction, right? You can still say there's just a bunch of little parts, just a bunch of little things arranged. Hmm. You know, the jargon is arranged lizard-wise, right? In other words, arranged like a lizard would be arranged, like its parts would be arranged if there were any lizards. Even with something like humans. So we would say all that a human is is just those parts moving around. It's parts arranged human-wise. Yeah, or better, there's no humans. There's just parts arranged human-wise, right? Okay. Um, it's still useful to talk in terms of humans, right? Because it's like, helps us get by, helps us talk about the world. Um, but there aren't any humans. Now, now I, let me clarify it. Maybe you think this means, like, I don't exist. Um, because, like, if I existed, I would be a human being, right? What else would I? I'm not a lizard, right? So I, I actually don't agree with that. I'm pretty sure I do exist. So I'm not sure what to say about this. One natural view is maybe I'm like a soul, a partless soul or something like that. Mm. And like that solves the problem really easily. Um, that's compatible with compositional nihilism, the view that there are no composite objects, because maybe a soul like doesn't have parts. Um, so that, that's a view you might have. And then that's compatible with this idea that there are no composite objects. Uh, I'm just not really sure I see much reason to think that's right. Um, on the other hand, I think there's reason to think there are no composite objects. On the other hand, I have reason to think I exist. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, so what gives? It seems like one of those things has to give, right? Right. Either I don't exist, or I'm a composite object, or I'm a simple object. Seems like those are the three options. Um, usually, maybe I'm stuck, right? We can make sense of that. Uh, and to be honest, I'm not sure what to think about all that. So I think you're right. These metaphysical puzzles can be applied to living organisms, including human beings. Mm. And that might have really big implications for personal identity, mm -hmm. especially like, do I exist? Right? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what to say about all that, to be totally honest. Okay. Uh, well, so yeah. let me let me throw an idea out there. This is where I'm leaning on these questions, but I don't like it, but I, I've just accepted I'm in a position I don't particularly like, which is uh, something like a metaphysical pluralism, that there are different categories of existence. So the reason there's a unique exception between um, physical objects or ordinary objects, tables and chairs and pens, uh, and seems to be a difference between humans and when you say, I do I exist, is because there's consciousness. The consciousness is not something that is this in the same category as ordinary objects. It's non-physical, non-spatial, it's non-composite. I guess that's close. Maybe that's another way of talking about souls. I'm not sure. But, but what do you, it, it doesn't seem like consciousness plays by the same parts in general. It seems to be some unique phenomena that's not just, you know, a unit of matter in a particular state moving around. Um, so I, I think one relevant question here is, can there be consciousness without somebody who is conscious, right? So um, that, is a, that is a hard one. Yeah, so it, I mean, like everybody agrees consciousness comes out of the brain somehow. Right. Or like the body. Right. Once the body does certain stuff. I think that's true. I think there's lots of people who disagree with that. Who? Name one person. Uh, his <laughs> historically, that it comes out of the brain. Because, I mean, everybody, everybody knows if you bonk somebody on the head, consciousness goes away. Right. Oh, well, every everybody would agree that I think that the brain is the brain states are correlated with mental states. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. That's oh, all. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That something like consciousness has something to do with what happens. Okay, yeah. Um, like everybody agrees with that. Uh, even dualists who think the mind is like separate from the brain it still thinks like the mind is like cause certain things in the mind are caused by yeah. certain things in the brain, right? Um, and why did I bring that up? Uh, yeah. So, so one interesting question is here relevant here is um, can there be consciousness without somebody who is conscious. So for example, one of my conscious mental states is that I'm hungry, right? So there, I'm hungry right now. I, I'm not that hungry, it's just an illustration. So can there be hunger without somebody who's hungry? Right. right? Uh, earlier I mentioned Buddhist philosophers who tended to defend compositional nihilism. There are no composite objects. One reason they were comfortable with that view is because they don't think there are people anyway, right? So they don't even run into these problems. They'd say, yeah, there can be hunger without anybody who's mm -hmm. hungry. There can be mental states without anybody instantiating those mental states. There can be consciousness without somebody who is conscious. That sounds totally wrong to me, right? Uh, there's no hunger unless somebody's hungry, right? Uh, there's no like red visual experience unless there's somebody having that red visual experience, right? Um, so, uh, this is relevant to what you were saying earlier because uh, well, you might think. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say this might be one reason to think there are composite objects, right? Um, so I think uh, Peter Van Inwagen, a philosopher, basically gives something like this kind of argument. Um, if composition, ah, sorry, um, if compositional nihilism were true, then there would be consciousness without anybody who is conscious, right? Uh, let, yeah, let's like leave out that soul view. Let's assume we can rule that out. Um, well that, but that's wrong. There can't be consciousness without somebody who's conscious. So I guess there are composite objects after all, because there has to be somebody who's con who has these like mental states, who sees red visual experiences, who's hungry, right? And the, the natural candidate is some composite object. Maybe like your, your brain, your brain is hungry. Maybe like some animal, some organism sitting where you're sitting right now. Uh, that's a composite object, right? Uh, so some people think, yeah, these considerations about consciousness and how consciousness works gives us some reason to think there are composite objects because it's like the best way to make sense of consciousness. Uh, if you deny that there are composite objects, you're probably going to be led to this totally counterintuitive position that there can be these conscious mental states like hunger without anybody who 
has those mental states. I mm -hmm. anybody who is hungry. Um, that does connect with what you had in mind, right? I hope I didn't take it on a tangent. Oh, very much so. This is a conversation I've had a couple times on this show, actually. And this is exactly the problem I struggle with because I've spoken with some Buddhists and I've spoken with a meditation practitioner who was telling me about this. And I have a hard time understanding how you can have experience without the experiencer. And I have a hard time ex understanding what the experiencer is. But what they've consistently said is it's kind of a matter of awareness, that it's a, like a matter of if you practice meditation long enough, you will see that it's only experience taking place without the experiencer. I haven't had that experience of, of being, of, of not having a perspective to my experience or being a being experiencing something. And so I just have to, I have to keep practicing meditation to be like, maybe I can get some insight on this. Yeah, I've never really understood that either. Because, yeah, this is allegedly an insight people have sometimes when they're meditating. They realize there's just these experiences. There's nobody having the experiences. Right. Um, and, uh, and this is a point which is frequently made in the history of Buddhist philosophy. It's a point David Hume made in Western philosophy. David Hume was like a Scottish philosopher two or 300 years ago. And he said something like this, right? If you introspect, you find a bunch of mental states. You find, like, hunger and pain and happiness whatever, but you don't find anybody who's hungry. You don't find anybody who's sad or happy or angry or whatever. Um, and uh, and I, I, I think I heard somewhere, the, and this other philosopher, uh, Thomas Reed, he responded, David, you know, Hume, you're looking in the wrong place. Right? Of course, you're not gonna, if you're looking for a person, you're not going to find them if you're looking at hunger, if you're looking at like mental states, <laughs> anger. You need to look to the person having those mental states, the person who is hungry, right? Um, that sounds totally right to me. Well, but, what uh, is it? What, what can you say about that person? What is its uh, nature? Well, that's a, I mean, that's a further question. I'm a little flummoxed. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know either. I, have... <laughs> I, I hit a, This is one of those areas where I, I really have hit a, a, a wall and my, my working solution in acting in the world is that there's like I said metaphysical pluralism that I, I there must be a being in addition to the consciousness or there is a being who is experiencing and it's just something like a soul that's the situation I feel like I'm forced into and oh, I don't wait, like why, it. why do you use the word pluralism to describe that again oh I, I use the word pluralism because um, it's more than dualism so there are some people that you know split the world between mind and body as if those are the only like mental stuff and physical stuff, those are only two categories. I think there are other categories, or, or, or I'm at least open to the possibility of there being something like abstract objects, or, or very specifically like the metaphysical status of uh, the laws of physics. We talked about a little bit. Um, I don't think it's physical themselves. I don't think they take up space. I don't think they're mental. I don't think they're an idea. I think they're in another category. Uh, oh, okay. Um, I see. Still sounds like dualism, even if you wouldn't want to use the word dualism to describe it, right? So, because uh, you still, if it were dualism, though, then I, but I would have to fit the laws of the universe into a mental category, which I don't, I don't, I you could do, but I don't like that idea. That would be something like, I, well, I think what that leads to is something like the laws of the universe are ideas in the mind of God or something like that, if they're mental in nature. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe. Maybe we're just getting hung up on the word dual of yeah. right? We're looking for like two ways to like two, like this two, this way of demarcating reality. So there's two main categories, right? Mm. Um, but I mean, are you endorsing a view where we, you exist, I exist, but we're not physical? It's like, that's close enough yes. to dualism. Yeah. All right. Yeah, it's pretty much dualism. And, you know, maybe, you know, I, I think most philosophers' objections to that, it's not a very popular view. I think most of the objections aren't very good. But I also think most of the arguments for it are, are not very good. Uh, so um, I might be in a similar boat with, boat with you where I'm mostly flummoxed. I think this view that I exist, but I'm not a physical object or anything like that. I think it, it should be investigated further. I don't think it should be dismissed as quickly as a lot of contemporary philosophers dismiss it. But um, there's also just not very I, I personally think there aren't very good arguments for it either. 
So this is what's like frustrating. It, it's what I think I, for a long time, I called myself a reluctant dualist, but I, I, I call myself a pluralist because of the problems with like laws of matter. But it, it's, I think that I actually agree with this. I think that the arguments for it can be very dubious but you can still arrive at it through process of elimination. You kind of back yourself into a corner and then it's like, well, I guess this is what I, this is what follows. It seems. Yeah. Yeah. That, no, that's probably the best. That sounds promising actually. Um, maybe that's what I should do. Maybe that's what I should admit. Um, cause I can't think of another view that sounds plausible. Man, I'm, where I'm at right now is just like, I'm pretty sure I exist. And, uh, maybe I just haven't thought of the right answer to the question. What am I right? What's the nature of, personal identity or personal ontology. Right. Um, and like, why would I expect to know, right? Uh, if, if I, if I do exist, pretty sure I can know that. Um, but like, why should I expect to know much about personal identity, right? Like maybe humans are just dumb and we haven't figured it out. But, um, I'm open to that. But, um, there's a, there's a very related problem with composition and talking about personal identity, which is when you talk about fat, what we think of as facets of you, we might say that well, you have a personality, like that's a way that people talk. But is that true? Does that mean that what you are is a composite object and you're made up of personalities and memories and past experiences? Or is yeah. it, or, or are we just talking about like a point of consciousness and that's the only thing that it doesn't have the property of be, of having a personality or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I think this is just a case where our language confuses us. We have these words like personality and it's personality is a noun. I guess there's this thing, a personality, right? Because <laughs> it refers to something. Um, and this is just a case where our everyday language isn't very perspicuous, right? Uh, like, you know, maybe you describe my personality as like, an, I'm an angry person, right? <laughs> um, uh, well, you don't have to say there's this thing, a personality, an angry personality. You can just say Andrew is angry, right? He's frequently angry. Uh, that way you're just talking about me. You're not saying there's this further thing of personality. Right? So um, there's just Andrew and he's just an angry per person. So um, so I think this is just a, a case where like, if we're really careful about the way we talk, mm -hmm. we won't confuse ourselves by like, using nouns that don't actually refer to anything, mm -hmm. personality. Right? Um, so I think that's really all that's going on in that case. I, I agree. Um, and for the most part, I think I agree. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is on this comp concept is is this idea of unification. This is something that I've talked about a, a little bit in some of the work that I'm doing where, so here's a, a question to go back to the central issue of simples and, and plurals. So we've got the individual grains of sand and let's say there's a heap in addition to the individual grains of sand. The question is what is the, the thing that unifies all of those individual things into one thing. So I think, I think if you think about that question, like what, is it a force? Is there some, is there some law of nature which says that whenever this many grains of sand are assembled in this way, that now there's a metaphysical glue that brings them all together into one object. I think a more, a much more sensible way of thinking about answering this, this question is to say the mind, our minds, our conceptual system is the glue. That the thing that unifies plurality into something that is one object is our idea. And that, that it, to the extent there is an object that exists in addition to the, the, the little parts, it's the mental object. It's that we're thinking about it as, uh, as some unique thing, right? Mm -hmm. So there are, so there, there, there are the individual units of sand. And then in addition to the individual units of sand, there is an idea of there being a heap of sand. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, that sounds right. If, if what you're saying is just, we reify these non-existent composite objects, this is a bunch of little objects that don't have parts. And, um, it like our brains are designed to like group objects together because it helps us get by. So for example, there's this, um, in cognitive science, there's this thing called the chunking mechanism, mm -hmm. where, this, where this is exactly what our brain does. You look at a bunch of birds flying in the sky, and like your brain can't keep track of all those individual birds. So it's like, oh, I, there's a flock of birds there, right? And then all of a sudden, your brain is tracking your visual experiences as like there's this big amorphous blob-like object in the sky, right? A flock of birds, right? So this is like something our brain does all the time. It like uh, reifies objects, like puts objects together, 
because it like helps us um, use our cognitive resources in a more efficient manner, right? Uh, it helps us get by. I, I think that's that sounds like what you're saying, right? And that, that's totally right. Uh, although we have to be careful how we describe this sort of view. We don't want to make it sound like we have these magic powers where we're actually creating these composite objects with our minds, right? Because um, some people have defended But in a sense, you are, right? The, the idea itself is is some unique thing. Um, I, I mean, you know, yeah, but you're not like actually creating a new object. Like if I draw Superman, I'm like, that's Superman, right? That doesn't mean I've actually created a person named Superman. But you, just, you've created an, an idea in your head, right? There's a fiction, there's Superman fiction, right? <laughs> well, isn't um, that something though? Oh, well, now we get into issues about like what about what are like mental yeah. objects, right? Okay, are so some... maybe that'll be in our next conversation. What, uh, what are well, mental I, objects? I, say I don't believe in that stuff either. I mean, it's just me. Uh, so you don't think it. there are ideas? No, I, this is just another case where our language confuses us. We have these nouns, ideas. I guess these nouns refer to something. Well, no, it's just like I. Um, a more perspicuous way of putting it would just be to replace the nouns with adverbs, right? And then it sounds goofy, but it's it's right. So like I don't have an idea, I um, I idealize, <laughs> or I think you can just say I think, right? I think. And then you're not talking about this mental object and idea. You're not reifying this thing, right? It's just me, and I'm thinking. So maybe then what an idea is, if we're trying to be concrete, is just another way of talking about some part of our experience. So like, um, like there, there is a particular mental state existing or, or th uh, there, there is at least one m mental state of a particular type in that exists, something like that. Uh, well, no, so I, I was just trying to offer a strategy to avoid talking about things called mental states, right? Okay. And this sounds, this sounds pedantic, right? <laughs> and then like be pedantic, but if we're trying to, if we're really concerned with what ultimately exists, right? Then we want to describe the world using our most perspicuous language possible. And then if you have nouns, those nouns better refer to something, mm. right? So like, that's why I was just offering a strategy of eliminating any nouns that refer to things which might not actually exist. So in this case, mental state, okay. you don't have to believe in these things, mental states. It's just me and I'm thinking, right? <laughs> but, but there's more going on, right? You, it's, it is, it would be an, uh, an unnecessarily um, abbreviated description of things that exist to just say it's you and your thinking, because with you have an internal experience. Is an in internal experience something that is like you can correctly describe phenomena in the universe by talking about your internal experience? Um. Uh. I mean, I, again, I think I think if we get really fancy with our adverbs. Then we can fully we can describe how I'm thinking okay. without using nouns that don't actually refer to anything like uh, uh, like fictional objects or uh, mental states or anything like that. Um, and uh, I mean, this doesn't have anything to do with composition. Right, right, right. You're right. I feel like we're getting <laughs> off into the uh, a sidetrack on it, which is a really interesting question. I mean, th this is uh, this is also very important that this relationship between the language in the world and nouns in the world and if we can if how we are to accurately talk about features of our experience you know i don't have a good answer here but it's it's definitely worth investigating but probably not on this episode yeah <laughs> all right well uh i really appreciate your time this has been an awesome conversation um i've certainly enjoyed it and i'd love to have you back on the show to kind of keep poking around some of these these issues sure yeah i enjoyed it <laughs>